the man that patented the automobile and took on the car industry. George Selden. Just months after founding his motor company in 1903, Henry Ford was standing in a Detroit freight yard watching his first automobile get loaded into boxcars when all of a sudden a messenger came running across the tracks telling him that what he was doing was illegal. Someone named George Selden had filed a suit against the Ford Motor Company for infringing on a patent he claimed gave him authority over every single gas-powered automobile in America. George Selden was a Rochester, New York patent attorney who in the late 1870s had become interested in building a horseless carriage powered by an internal combustion engine. He started with the engine, and when that didn't work, he nonetheless imagined that if it had, he would put it in a wagon of some sort. He made a drawing, drafted a patent application, and submitted this claim on May 8, 1879. Neither Selden nor anybody else in America was capable of making such a vehicle in that year. But Selden knew that the patent law then in force contained a useful provision. He could postpone the beginning of the patent's 17-year life by making regular amendments to it. These he scrupulously filed. Some were as minor as changing an and to the. But they kept the patent alive. The law allowed him 17 years of this fiddling. Then he had to accept the patent or withdraw it. Selden spent 16 of those years watching the nascent car industry ripen. Then in 1895, he finally pulled the trigger and got his patent for the production of a safe, simple, and cheap road locomotive. Light in weight, easy to control, and possessed sufficient power to overcome any ordinary inclination. It would have a steering mechanism, either one or several cylinders, a clutch, a brake, and so forth. None of these was described in any detail, and as it turned out, it didn't need to be. On November 5th, 1895, Selden was issued a U.S. patent number, 549,160. He had sought, and amazingly got, a patent for the ideal of an automobile. For several years, Selden sat on his patent, helpless to do anything with it because he lacked the money to hire lawyers to press his claim. This problem solved itself, though, in the spring of 1899, when the financier William Whitney, interested in buying a car company, thought he'd better check and see if there was any lurking patent that might cause problems down the road. This led to George Selden, who was surprised and delighted to be given 10 grand for his patent and 5% of any royalties it might generate. In June, Whitney's lawyers started sending letters out to American car makers. Our clients inform us that you are manufacturing and advertising for sale vehicles which embody the invention of the Selden patent. We notify you of this infringement and request that you desist from the same and make suitable compensation to the owner thereof. These demands drew the responses that could have been expected, either hostile or non-existent, and then Whitney's men began to sue. They picked Alexander Winton as their first target. He was then the foremost car maker in America, and Whitney figured if they could get a judgment against him, then the smaller fries would fall into line. Winton's lawyers replied with the argument that the patent should be dismissed because the Selden car was no invention at all. The substitution of a gas engine for the steam ones that inventors had been mounting on their road vehicles for nearly a century was nothing more than common sense. Judge Alfred C. Cox disagreed. The patentee's contribution to the art should not be considered from a narrow point of view, said Cox in an impressively elegant ruling issued that November. His work should not be examined through an inverted telescope, 
The horizon of invention should not be contracted to the periphery of a sixpence. Selden must be regarded as the first to construct a road locomotive provided with a liquid hydrocarbon gas engine of the compression type. Of course, Selden had not constructed anything, but in what was still the dawn of a fast-flowing technological revolution, Ford tended to look kindly on sweeping claims for basic patents. Cox's ruling meant that the case would have to be tried in court, but Wenton was a fighter. He organized a confederation of automaker allies and in 1901 filed his answer to Cox. 32 separate defenses unfurled across 1,400 pages and backed by 126 patents, American, British, and French, awarded beginning in 1794. The trial lasted two wearing years, while Winton's allies fell away, and he found himself alone shouldering the immense legal fees. He eventually gave up and came over to Whitney's side. Whitney welcomed him with generous terms, and a group of car companies now in the financier's camp founded an organization called the Association of Licensed Automobile Makers, or known as ALOM for short, and they would seek out and find those who defied the patent. And they were serious. Every automobile made in America or sold here had to display a three-inch wide brass plaque stamped with an image of Selden's theoretical car. If it didn't, patent sleuths went after the owner. One Manhattanite was scared enough to ask the dealer who had sold him an unlicensed car to tell the Alon people he had fled to Texas and died there. Needless to say, it didn't work. Henry Ford was more stubborn than Winton. As soon as he got word of the suit against him, his business manager replied in an automotive trade journal, So far as our plan of action is concerned for the future, it is extremely simple. We intend to manufacture and sell all the gasoline automobiles of the type we are constructing that we can. We regard the claims made by the Selden patent as covering the monopoly of such machines as entirely unwarranted. The AWOM immediately took out ads, saying that if you bought a Ford, you were buying a lawsuit too. Ford said his company would indemnify any buyer. By now, Ford was standing against the $70 million consortium. We possess just enough of that instinct of American freedom, he said, to cause us to rebel against oppression or unfair competition. He would not pay graft money. The case came to trial in 1909. Judge Charles Merrill Hugh brooded over the evidence for a full summer, then returned to deliver his opinion. The patent speaks from the date of issue, and unless Selden did something unlawful during his 16 years wrangle with patent examiners, he is within the law, and his rights are the same of those as the promptest applicant. Judge Hugh found for Selden. Ford said, We will fight to the finish. But by now, he was fighting almost alone. Even General Motors had joined the ALOM. But the public was on Ford's side. In fact, he had become something of a folk hero. For the first time, nationally viewed as an individual rather than just the name on a car. His appeal came to trial in late November, and on January 9, 1911, Judge Walter Chadwick Noyes read the decision. Every element in the Selden claim was old, and the combination itself was not new. That did for Selden's insistence that he alone had invented the automobile, and the case came down to the engine he had stipulated. It was a two-stroke rather than a four-stroke, then and now, used in virtually every automobile. The patent held only for cars using the already obsolete two-stroke, and Ford and every other car maker, neither legally nor morally, owed Selden anything. Within the next few hours, Ford received a thousand congratulatory telegrams. The ALOM dissolved, leaving behind it some valuable legacies. Among them was the reform of the patent laws, as well as a patent-sharing arrangement among car makers 
that still exist in the industry to this day. 